I have a lot of questions, um, yes, and I don't know where to start. Um, I'm actually going to go out of order of what I originally wanted to ask you to begin with, but just based on some of the things you said, let me piggyback on that a little bit yes. before we talk more specifics about your book. Why is it, do you, what's your opinion, without disparaging people, but I'm going to mention some figurative people in our culture like the Al Sharptons and the yep. Joy Reeds, why do you think, do, do, you, do you think they actually believe or the, the victim mentality, or are there people in general today who are capitalizing on it for personal gain yeah. of some yeah. kind? What's your assessment yeah. of that? Yeah, no, humbly, I, I believe is, is both. And that, that again, Second, Second Corinthians 4, 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Without, without a, a person's heart yeah. being surrendered to the Lord, they're subject to blindness and deception. Yeah. And Jesus warns us most about that in the last days. And so I think they're, they're sincerely deceived. But in that deceit, in that deceit, I do think that there's a number of folks that understand it's a, it's a power base. Um, it's a way to, to, to maintain influence. Um, when you start preaching a zero victim message and the love of God, it's self-effacing. You become irrelevant. Yeah. It, it requires you to die to self. And so I do think that there's a, there's a group of, of purveyors out there who are, who are utilizing that. And I really think personally that it's, it's really uh, hindering the progress of, of black Americans, which is why I'm so motivated to share, to share this message. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So take us back to, you, you and I were talking earlier, you actually wrote your book in 2014, mm -hmm. and then you revised it in 2019 yep. by really God's sovereign direction in your life, because unbeknownst to you, yeah. in 2020, you would be thrust into the national spotlight. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who, you might have remembered seeing him on television in 2020, the Kenosha, Wisconsin riots that happened, and Jacob Blake yep. was shot uh, a young black man mm -hmm. shot by a white police officer, mm -hmm. I think like seven times right. in the back. Right. And Jacob's mother was at your church. You were her pastor and are, are, are is she still at your yep, church? Still at the church. And, um, and so, and she gave a very passionate um, press conference to, to try to tamp down yep. the rioting. And you came along as her pastor and you, you for a time there, mm. I don't think this is an exaggerated statement, you kind of pastored the country for a time yeah. because your voice helped to give some calm yeah. and perspective. Take us back to, yeah. to that time because you, you had already written a book, Unbeknownst to God Would Thrust You Into This Public Spotlight. You were on yeah. every major network, every yeah. cable station, everything. Talk yeah. about that a little bit and how God, yeah. what was God doing then and sure. he's still doing. Yeah, prior to 2020, um, kind of on the backside of the wilderness. We'd be in small little Friday night prayer meetings, praying about zero victim. I'd be preaching to our congregation and the Lord was preparing us during that time. And as you said, uh, Jacob's mom, an amazing woman, was part of our prayer team. And, and I can tell you, I'm proud of Jacob. Jacob's recommitted his life to the Lord. He's a Praise member of God. our church. He has prayed a prayer of forgiveness. I led him in a prayer of forgiveness Praise of the God. officer that shot him. And God is, is blessing him. And, it's, and he's and it's paralyzed him. from now. He's from paralyzed the, uh, from the waist, from the waist, waist down. down. Yeah. So that's yeah. even more of a miracle that you can forgive someone, yeah. not only who shot you, but left you paralyzed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, the, the nation, the, they had no use for that narrative. They don't yeah. hear about forgiveness and zero victim thinking. Right. You right. know, but he's, yeah. he's doing, doing well. And, and as you said, we were prepared and during that time of, of sharing in the press conference, um, that's when things began to happen. A few days later, get a call from the White House and then Sharon and I were invited to be part of the round table and things just really kind of took off from there. And we knew that this was our message. You know, that Romans 16, 25, Paul says, my gospel and the preaching of, of Jesus Christ. We knew that this was our message to deliver to a nation that's needed right now. And so we have it in our heart to to help shepherd the nation and care for the soul yes. of the, the nation. Because this is such a hot topic. That's why I love your voice mm -hmm. and Sharon's voice into this discussion, because it is so needed. But it's, a, it's almost as if, so God calls you to write this book. Mm -hmm. You have this message that's burning in your heart. And then you have to actually put it into practice yourself, mm -hmm. because when then at that time, when President Trump contacts you and you have this meeting with him, 
Yep. You got pushback oh, from yeah. your own black community. <laughs> so talk. So now you're having to practice this yeah. right from the get go. Yeah. Because people are angry at you. Yep. 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 Talk about how you navigated all that. Yeah, it's 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 something that we we live it. Um, we did get pushed back. We still get pushed back. Um, but it we're zero victim. So the pushback is <laughs> is irrelevant because we we live the message. And it it comes the heart of zero victim really comes from a place, Pastor Gary, of total surrender. Yeah. It's Galatians two twenty yeah. of being crucified with Christ and being dead to self. And I think that this is a time for the church, um, you know, passages like I think Revelation 12, 11, we quote often, uh, we overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. But I think the third part is so critical and they love not their lives until the death. Yeah. That we're coming to a place that I think that believers, we've got to truly die to self. And I think even be willing to die that we both live for Christ but if it costs us our life, I think to, to step into the grace of God, we've got to be fearless and we got to see to it that we're not victims. And so this message, I think, is a great companion to the scriptures to help us know how to think. Yeah. And it, it touches issues of, of justice and some of the, the social political issues. But again, in, in areas of life, we do workshops in school sometimes. And I have three, third grade and fourth grade kids coming to me with tears and saying, I was a victim because my friend Johnny got a new bike and I didn't get a bike and he got on vacation, went on vacation. <laughs> I didn't get on vacation and I was upset because he got new shoes that I wanted. And kids recognize I'm a victim. And mm -hmm. so it's something that I think that, that touches every person. And it's a mindset that freedom brings us into the, the liberty that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. You talk in your book about, you, you noticed, quote, some white privilege, but mm -hmm. yet you didn't resent it. Right. You actually, it, it somewhat motivated you to say to yourself, yeah. I can achieve too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, f faith is the key. You know, yeah. God, God is no respecter of persons, you know. So even coming back to, you know, for, for the black community, I'm passionate about, about us rediscovering the scriptures yeah. and who God is. You know, we can, we can preach people up and down and say, no weapon formed against you prospers. And we shout and we say, amen except the weapon of racism yeah. <laughs> or except the weapon, weapon of injustice. No weapon means no weapon. You know, I tell folks all the time, man, I'm, I'm more Jewish than black American. I'm the seed of Abraham. It's like, it's, <laughs> there you go. I mean, I got, you know, if you're a Christ, you're an Abraham yeah. seed. You God go. has a covenant with me. He's, he's sworn to bless me and to, for me to live out his purposes for my life. And so it, it really, really brings us to the place that we got to rediscover who we are in, in Christ. So true. And part of dealing with, because you mentioned about the past, all yep. of us have some kind of past yep. thing we got yep. to deal with. Forgiveness is such a key to whatever the past is. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people about how to best forgive? Yep. One, of, one of the most practical ways is to really contemplate the potential of your future. So let's go back to that number line dealing with your past, deciding your person, then developing your potential. Harboring unforgiveness robs you from the fullness of your potential in God. God himself says, if you don't forgive, then that disqualifies you, disqualifies you from God's That's forgiveness right. and his grace is stunted in your life. And I simply tell folks, when you really com com contemplate your future, your family, what it is that God has for you, deprive your enemy the right to control your life for the rest of your life. Yes, yes. If, if you harbor unforgiveness, mm -hmm. there is something that, that you are disqualified from in your future because God looks at your heart and your heart is not in right disposition to him. And so don't, don't give your enemy the glory and the dignity of disqualifying you from God's future. Release love and forgiveness by the power of the cross. When Jesus said it is finished, Trust the word of God that it is finished. Relinquish it to him. Pray for him. God's going to, you know, bless your enemies. He says you're going to be yeah. perfect. You'll be like your father in heaven when you, when you bless those who curse you. We want to be like Christ. And so I would encourage anyone is to do it by faith and to trust the Lord. And you'll, you'll see the liberty of God open up, not just for you, but for your children and your grandchildren. You know, yeah. Pastor Gary, I think, I think in some situations families are suffering. 
yeah. because children and grandchildren are suffering because we're harboring unforgiveness in our lives. And so do it for yourself and for your family, yeah. for your future. And would you agree, James? I've, I've always said that, you know, forgiveness is sometimes a, a process where, yeah. where that stuff keeps creeping up every once in a while. Yeah. And, yeah. You, and forgiveness is not necessarily a, a one and done prayer. Correct. It's sometimes a process yeah. of working through things. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you brought up the term process. There's a verse of scripture. I was just talking to our church about this. It's uh, Hebrews 5.13, uh, when the writer of Hebrews uh, writes that the people, you're, he says you're unskilled in the word of righteousness. And I, I've been explaining that the word of God requires skill, skill. Mm -hmm. So if you're unskilled in the word of righteousness, you can be skilled in the word of righteousness. And I just shared at a, at a conference that I believe counselors, therapists, those who help with mental health and the mental health profession, I really believe that they are in the business of helping us develop the skill mm -hmm. for the word of righteousness. Mm -hmm. As pastors, we preach God's word. We preach the word of God, but there's a skill to be able to, to operate the scriptures and to work the scriptures. And I really think those in the mental health space help us develop the skill to handle the word of righteousness. And so to your point, it's a process. Skill means effort, development. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a drummer. Sometimes I do an exercise and I can, I can do rudiments, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right. Mm -hmm. That's, those are the fundamental building blocks of, of doing the complex things in life, but it's a skill. I can pray and fast for God to make me a great drummer, but if I don't sit down and put in the effort and work the skill, I'll never grow. And I think in some situations it's like, Lord, just help me forgive, help it all go away. Yeah. But we need to understand the skill of speaking God's word, believing God's word, repenting, you know, standing in faith. And we have to learn to work the word of righteousness. So you're right, it is a process sometimes and we have to, we have to commit to it. As long as we go to godly therapists, right? Yeah, yeah. that's I don't that's, want the secular it. stuff getting in there. <laughs> all right, right. You, on page four, 64, you said, quote, when right attitudes have been decided upon, emotions follow instead of leading. Yeah. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, I believe we, we're dealing with emotional idolatry. I really think that in, in many instances when our, our feelings um, get to the point that they really dictate our conduct and bring us to the place that we're acting out of character, especially as believers, I believe I, I'm, emotional idolatry is an, is an issue that um, feelings have now began to dictate um, who people are, what they do, what they believe, mm. even for believers more so than God's word. I, I think it's amazing that, that Jesus tells us the, the first and the greatest commandment, I like to say, is to be totally emotional about God and our neighbors. The first and greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And I sometimes think, why would God tell us to to, to be totally emotional about him mm. because that is a heart that is completely given over to him that there is no room for feelings or emotions that are contrary to God's nature. And so I think that somewhere along the line, Jeremiah 17 talks to us about that as we you know, it's a, yeah. our heart is deceitful and desperately yeah. wicked. And, and in many situations, I, I say that emotions are more powerful than intellect, which is why sometimes you know, ladies who've been abused by a guy will continue to be in a relationship with a guy that she knows is no good for her is because her emotions are stronger than intellect. Sometimes guys will gamble away the family money mm -hmm. knowing that it's wrong, but in many situations, emotions can be more powerful than intellect. And so we have to see to it that our hearts, we love the Lord with all of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And I believe that becomes a, a safety mechanism that keeps us engaged and focused on the things of God. Keep talking about that. So how yeah. do you rein in emotions and, and make sure that your heart is yep. solidly with the Lord? Yep. Sur surrender. Surrender yep. is the key. Psalm 51, 10 or so, Lord, create, create in me, you know, yeah. one, one, you know, interpretation of this, Lord, manufacture in me a clean heart. And we have to literally go before the Lord and ask God to give us his heart, to take away the stony heart, as he said, yeah. to take away the heart of flesh. I, I tend to believe that one of the reasons perhaps that we're, that David is known as a man after God's own heart is because he prayed for God to create the kind of heart in him yeah. that God, that God wanted. So if God 
can create in me a clean heart, he's going to make the kind of heart that he approves of. And we become a man and a woman after God's own heart. So it's a, it's a heart issue. Surrender, surrender is the key. That's so good. Yeah. I have never thought about that, mm -hmm. that David's heart after God yeah. was because he prayed for it. He prayed for, for it. Yeah. He, he asked. Yeah. So, so take us back. You first mm -hmm. wrote the book 2014. You revised it 2019, yep. right before everything happened in 2020 that thrust you into the national spotlight. Why did you first write this? What, yep. what was, was there any one particular motivating reason yep. that you felt called to write the book? Yeah, the, 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 the seed, the DNA was in me. And I have a good friend who lives in the area, um, one of Sharon's college buddies that we become great friends. And he's, you know, my publishing partner. And so we, we met together and I had this idea that I, knew, I originally wanted to write about something else. And we sat down and do kind of a, you know, creative session. And he said, James, forget about what you want to write about. When you talk about this victim thing, you come alive and something stirs within you. And so yeah. he, he first put the idea that you really need to write about zero victim. And then I started to go back to, uh, you know, my childhood, you know what I mean? And recognize that I believe this is one of my unique messages to deliver. It's not the only thing I share, but this is a message I'm supposed to deliver. Quick story, the origin yeah. of zero victim where I got the title is I was on staff um, at a church for two years and we took an attitudinal assessment. And one of the categories in that attitudinal assessment was the degree to which you see yourself as a victim. There was a victim category. Hmm. I took the assessment. My score came back at zero. Wow. <laughs> so the guy, the guy who facilitated the, the um, assessment, he called me up and says, I've been doing this for 20 years. I have never seen anyone score zero in the wow. area of victim thinking. Everybody has some degree of victim. I've never seen a zero. <laughs> And that's when I began to explain to him the third grade story and kind of talk through it. And the concept became clear. And that's where I got the term zero victim. So I like to say I'm, I'm credentialed and I'm certified <laughs> in, in, uh, in being zero victim. I would think so too. <laughs> well, James, our time has already escaped us. Thank you so much for being here. The book wow. is Zero Victim. Yes. It's available out there. I'm sure it's available too for online viewers. Yes. It's on Amazon. Yeah, yeah, it's and on Amazon, Audible, you know, ebook all over the place. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. being here and thank you for the voice that yeah. you bring of reason and sanity yes, to sir. a crazy yeah. world. Yes. James, we love you. We yes, thank you. Everybody, Pastor thank you, James my friend. Moore. Man, I'm so grateful, man. That means the world to me, man. I'm so thankful for you. So thank, thank you, my friend. Thank you, guys. Thank wow. Thank yeah. you so much. What an honor. Thank wow. You, what an honor. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for James. We just pray you would continue to use him and Sharon and their family that wherever they go and the message they bring would be so fruitful and meaningful to people who hear it and read about it. We just thank you for what you're doing in the kingdom, Lord, and how you knit people together from different parts of the country and different parts of the world to serve you for the sake of your glory. And we just give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.